Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. I'm Brad Wilson. I'm with the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions here at Princeton. We're part and parcel with the Department of Politics. We're grateful uh, to be part of uh, that wonderful faculty. Uh, today we have uh, the most recent installment of our Stuart lecture series on institutional corruption in America. We thank the Stewart Family Foundation for supporting this series over the last couple of years. Um, our guest today is Shep Melnick. Uh, Shep uh, is the author of this very recent book, The Transformation of Title IX, Regulating Gender Equality in Education. Uh, he is the Tip O'Neill Professor of American Politics at Boston College. Uh, his extensive writings on the intersection of law, politics, and policy includes uh, his book, Regulation and the Courts, in the case of the Clean Air Act. This is back in 1983, published by Brookings Institution. And then uh, Between the Lines, Interpreting Welfare Rights, also by Brookings in 1994. Before he joined the politics faculty at Boston College, he taught at Harvard and Brandeis, where he chaired the politics department. Uh, and for many years, he has been serving as the co-chair of the Harvard program on constitutional government. I suspect that his co-chair is Harvey Mansfield. Yes. Uh, from, um, in 2012, he received the American Political Science Association's Law and Court Section uh, Lasting Contribution Award. Uh, Shep received his BA and his PhD from Harvard University. Um, Title IX is something that is uh, now uh, approach, is approaching now a few more years. It's 50th anniversary, uh, I think 1972. It was put into place uh, as an uh, education amendment. Um, are you going to tell them the language of, of, I won't read it if you're going to, you'll give them the language of, of the amendment. Uh, which uh, Shep uh, describes as somewhat uh, open-ended and ambiguous, uh, and that's what's, uh, why we still hear a lot about it today, because there's a lot of uh, regulatory and judicial action surrounding uh, this very, very important amendment. So I give you Shep Nauman. Thanks, Brad. It's really great to be here, especially on such a beautiful day on such a beautiful campus. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of current events uh, on Title IX to show you, uh, that provide some of the background of what's going on here. So uh, about two weeks ago, the New York Times uh, reported on a leaked uh, possible proposal to a regulation uh, on how s the word sex would be defined under Title IX. I just want to point out this was not a regulation, it wasn't a proposal, it was a leaked draft of a proposal. Uh, the Times then ran a uh, uh, editorial um, and an op-ed piece saying that the Trump administration was erasing transgender students. Um, and there are a number of other letters and articles saying that this has traumatized uh, a number of uh, transgender children. The, I will not to leave out Princeton, but uh, the president of Princeton um, signed a letter with the president of Rutgers and Penn, uh, wrote a letter to Secretary DeVos saying our deep, expressing our deep concern and dismay at reports of possible withdrawal of federal protection for transgender students. Um, now, this was not, if this proposal had actually gone into effect, it wouldn't have actually changed any policy because the policy um, that was being challenged had never gone into effect. So I just uh, use this as an example of how uh, politicized and how kind of dramatized these controversies have become and exactly where this came from, I'll explain in my talk. The second um, controversy was about two months ago, there was a leak, another leaked document through the New York Times about um, the possible proposal on sexual harassment that is being considered by the Department of Education. This will probably come out in the next month. Secretary DeVos promised it over a year ago, um, and I can assure you when that, those, draft, those proposals come out, there will be months and months of debate, very heated debate. 
So th th here's the question I want to raise. Why has Title IX become so controversial? Um, we can start from the fact that Title IX is among the most successful federal laws ever enacted. Um, the purpose of Title, Title IX was to end discrimination in educational institutions uh, that are funded by federal money, discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, the, the law is very simple. It basically says any institution that receives federal funding shall not discriminate upon on the basis of sex. It doesn't say what sex means. It doesn't say what discrimination means. But it does, by the, I'll point out in a minute, have a number of exceptions. So for example, private undergraduate colleges uh, are not covered in their admissions process by uh, Title IX. So that's why we have Wellesley and Smith. Um, if Princeton wanted to go back and be men only, as it was when I, um, I was recalling that I had my interview as a high school senior exactly 50 years ago uh, this month here. Um, and at that time, there were uh, no women. Uh, if they wanted to go back, they could, but of course, they won't. So what have we accomplished in those 46 years since passage of Title IX? In 1972, 58% of college students were male and only 42% were female. By 2010, those numbers had flipped. Uh, now we're about 58 female, 42 male. In 1970, women earned, uh, men earned eight times as many PhDs as women. Today, women earn more PhDs than men, even in the sciences, if you count biology. Um, once all but shut out of medical school and law school and business school, women are reaching parity in all of those fields. Uh, at the elementary and secondary uh, level, Girls outperform boys in every aspect of education. They have higher grades, they have higher aspirations, they take more AP courses, they participate in more extracurricular activities. As Thomas Dupreet and Claudia Buckman uh, put it in their uh, really interesting book called The Rise of Women, quote, women have not merely gained educational equality with men. On many fronts, they have surpassed men by a large and growing margin. Um, so the paradox is this, that, uh, that this has been a remarkably successful law. Um, you could say we have really achieved victory in making sure that we have equal opportunity for women, but the law is more controversial, or at least the regulations issued under it are more controversial than ever. Um, for many years, athletics was by far the most controversial part of Title IX. Um, then in uh, 2000, 11, that was displaced by sexual harassment regulations. This is the most controversial. Uh, and then that has been displaced with transgender rules as the most controversial. Now, uh, uh, each one of these proposals, the Obama administration's proposal on sexual harassment um, and the Obama administration's uh, proposal on transgender rights, have received harsh criticism. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, 19, uh, the 2016 Republican platform devoted a special uh, section of the platform to Title IX, charging the original purpose of Title IX had been perverted, quote, by bureaucrats and by the current President of the United States to impose a social and cultural revolution upon the American public. Uh, I didn't realize this was a, a series on political corruption, but probably that indicates that some people think this is an example of that. But I want to point out that the sexual harassment regulations weren't just criticized by conservatives and Republicans. They received heavy criticism for, from civil libertarians um, and from very, some very distinguished um, uh, feminist law professors, especially four at Harvard who wrote a really eloquent letter saying about these regulations threaten due process and they threaten freedom of speech. Um, the Trump administration very quickly withdrew the two most controversial Dear Colleague letters issued under Title IX. That was on sexual harassment um, and transgender rights. But these issues are not going away. If anything, they are going to become more uh, intense over time. Uh, the, the in part because on transgender rights, <coughs> The circuit courts have actually upheld many of the policies of the Obama administration, uh, and uh, we have yet to see what the uh, uh, Trump administration will come out with on the sexual harassment front. So these things are going to be with us for a very long time. Why? 
what's, what's, why have we have such a, a, a contrast between these enormous accomplishments and this enormous controversy? And my answer, in a nutshell, and I've actually figured I have to provide an elevator talk about what this book is about, so here's, here's my paragraph. The key to understanding this paradox is noting how distant the current Title IX controversies are from education as conventionally understood. The original purpose of Title IX was to reduce institutional barriers to women's education. And in 1972, there were a lot. There were many programs that were not open to women. There was really rampant discrimination against female faculty members. So there were lots of institutional bars. As those faded away, uh, the, the purpose of Title IX regulation gradually subtly changes to trying to undo sexual stereotypes that are in the thinking not just of students and faculty and administrators, but the public at large. So we went from trying to remove institutional barriers to eradicating all types of sexual stereotypes, not just about gender roles, but about sexuality and gender in general. So that is a much expanded understanding. As I try to put it uh, in a succinct form, um, regulation started in the classroom, it then moved to the playing fields, and then ended up in the bedroom and the bathroom, uh, uh, quite literally. Um, now, this transformation was, is not easy to trace um, for the reason that the regulation, the form that regulation takes under Title IX is very subtle and convoluted and subterranean. So I'm going to uh, provide a little bit of background on the form of regulation. I promised someone I would say something about the Administrative Procedure Act um, and notice and comment rulemaking, but I, it, it is important to kind of get into the mechanics of the institutional relationships to understand how this change took place. Now, um, Title IX, uh, one of the sections of it says that Agencies that distribute federal funds have the authority to issue rules and regulations to carry out the act. That's true of most, uh, most federal statutes. Uh, those rules and regulations are governed by the Administrative Procedure Act that says when you issue a rule, you have to pr put out a proposal, you have to have comments, and then you have to explain why you end up with your final rule. It's to have reasoned decision making and public participation. Title IX goes one step further in a way that's quite unusual. It says those regulations need to be signed by the President of the United States. The idea was that these would, could be politically controversial matters, um, and we want to make sure the President personally took responsibility for them. The last time that the Office for Civil Rights and the Department of Education issued, used these procedures for a major Title IX regulation was 1975. So ever since 1975, they have used other procedures to basically go uh, evade the Administrative Procedure Act and the presidential signature required requirement. They have used interpretations, clarifications of interpretations, and the now ubiquitous Dear Colleague letter. The Dear Colleague letter, by the way, is just a letter sent out by the head of the Office of Civil Rights saying, this is what we expect you to do. Um, some of us who are teachers in universities, do not consider regulators our colleagues. Um, but evidently, they think that uh, they are our colleagues. Uh, why, so that's one big change in the way in which regulation took place. The other was the enforcement mechanism. Uh, the way in which uh, uh, Title IX was expected to be enforced was a cutoff of federal funds. If you do not comply with the law, if you do not comply with regulations, you're going to lose your federal funds. And I will bet that almost every person in this room who spent time in academia will, will have been told by someone in the hierarchy, if you don't comply with these rules, we're going to lose all our federal funds. I was told that we would lose all our federal funds at BC if I didn't get my textbook list in on time. Um, I told them I didn't think that was going to happen. Um, and as a matter of fact, the total number of times over the last 46 years the Title IX funds have been cut off um, is zero. Zero. They don't do it. They will not do it. Because they realize that the funding cutoff is too politically dangerous, it's too administratively cumbersome, and it is likely to hurt the people they're trying to help. So they just don't use it. They threaten it, um, but they don't do it. 
So how is Title IX enforced? How are these regulations enforced? And the answer is um, through the courts. Um, the Supreme Court in 1979 recognized the so-called implied private right of action, which meant that private citizens can bring suit against institutions um, seeking both injunctions and monetary damages. And it's the threat of this litigation that really has put teeth into uh, uh, the Office for Civil Rights Regulations, and to the extent that the courts are willing to defer to dear colleague letters, they become, in effect, the binding law that will be enforced in court. Now, one of the uh, uh, consequences of this way, uh, this form of, of uh, regulation, writing, and enforcement is that you have two actors involved here, um, and they often engage in what I call institutional leapfrogging. That is, that the agency will take one small step, the court will build upon that, the agency will take another step, uh, and on and on, all the while, all of them denying that they are doing anything new. Um, so you got incremental expansion um, with very little deliberation or consideration of costs, um, with very little consideration of the long-term consequences of what is going on. I'll give you some examples of that. But what's really remarkable is that if you take at face value what the Office for Civil Rights has said over the last several decades, they have not done anything new since 1975. Um, for example, the, the sexual harassment regulations that were issued by the Obama administration in 2011 and 2014, um, the, the White House described them as groundbreaking. This was really big stuff, and most people in universities realized that this was really big stuff. Office of Civil Rights said, nothing new here. Just establish policy, and we don't have to defend it. Um, so let me give you some examples um, and how this worked out. First in athletics, and then I'll talk a bit about transgender rights, and then I'll finish up talking about sexual harassment. Um, and I just want to say, so I'm going to focus a lot on, policy, uh, on process here. My general argument is that a flawed process produces flawed policies. So if you say, why did we end up in this place with kind of strange rules, I think it has to do a lot with the, with the flaws in the process. So let me first talk about athletics. Um, here's how institutional leapfrogging proceeded. 1975, we had some very vague regulations written by the Ford administration. 1979, during the Carter administration, there were interpretations of those regulations that included something called the three-part test. Some of you know about athletics. Might, have you ever heard about the three-part test? Um, it's, a really, it's kind of the central part of regulation. Um, this had no explanation. It was in the middle of these very long interpretations of the regulations. The, this interpretation lay dormant for nearly a uh, decade because of the Grove City case um, that really suspended enforcement of these regulations uh, during the 1980s. Um, but then in the early 1990s, there was a flood of litigation on, uh, on athletics. Uh, and the First Circuit, um, issued a, uh, an interpretation of the three-part test that both in, in really enshrined it as the heart of regulation and took a very strict interpretation of it, meant that, that colleges would have a very hard time ever cutting any women's sports, and they were expected to keep adding women's sports until they reached parity, a term I'll explain in a minute. Um, this was extended by the Clinton OCR in a series of letters, clarifications, and additional Dear Colleague letters. The Bush administration tried to um, draw back on this a bit um, through more Dear Colleague letters. I actually love the, the title of one of them, Additional Clarification Three-Part Test Part Three. <laughs> that was the name of the Dear Colleague letter. Um, and then the Obama administration issued an even uh, longer Dear Colleague letter basically saying we're not going to follow, we're going to ignore the Bush administration's dear colleague letter. Why all of this controversy about sports? Um, is sports such an integral part of educational process that it deserves all of its attention? Um, well, no. <laughs> um, uh, it is an extracurricular activity, supposedly. Uh, at BC, sometimes the extracurricular activity of football takes precedence over everything else. Um, it is often a highly corrupting aspect of the educational process. 
Um, so why this attention? And there's a very simple reason for that. It is one of the very few parts of the educational process where we segregate by sex. So what we have in, in athletics is separate but equal. Then the question is, what's equal? Um, and that has been a very difficult process uh, question to answer for, for a long time. You know, in, uh, in political science courses, we don't say, okay, we're going to have a separate class for men and women. We would, most of us would be revolted by that idea. Um, but uh, but uh, we think it's reasonable in sports because it would be unfair to women to expect them to compete against guys who are bigger and taller and stronger um, um, on average. 1975, those regulations I mentioned, uh, they tried to address this issue, but they were very vague. Basically, they just said that all educational institutions must, um, must uh, have uh, uh, in athletic opportunities that, quote, fairly reflect the relative interest and abilities of male and female students. Reasonable, thought, but, but pretty vague. Um, now, eventually, in the 1990s, as a result of court action, and administrative action, this leapfrogging, we ended up with a system um, that made two key decisions and that we're living with them today. One of these has been very controversial. The other one, I think, has been unfortunately ignored. So the first, the first crucial decision that made um, was that federal judges and administrators rejected the so-called relative interest and ability standard in favor of what was called the parity standard. Relative interest means that you figure out how many of your students are interested in, say, varsity sports, club sports, intramural sports, and you provide the array that reflects the relative interest. Parity standard says that if you have 58% female students, 58% of your athletes should be female. Now, most schools don't meet that, but that is expected to be the goal in which they are, for which they are striving. Um, some schools actually are over 60 or 65 percent female, and, the, and their uh, athletic opportunities are expected to meet that 60 or 65 percent target. The clearest and most important explanation for this standard came from the First Circuit in a 1996 decision called Brown University versus Cohen. Now, often um, when I'm speaking to audiences, I have to explain that Brown is not known to be a powerhouse. Um, I think in this audience, I realize you, you, most of you realize that Brown is usually in the cellar of the Ivy League in most sports. Um, it is known to be a particularly kind of liberal school um, that doesn't put a great emphasis on athletics. Um, but Brown became the poster child of the schools that were not meeting the parity standard. And this is what the First Circuit said, and, and this decision was repeated over and over and over, that um, women's current level of interest in competitive sports, quote, reflects women's historical lack of opportunities to participate in sports. As a result, to provide fewer athletic participation opportunities for women than for men, based upon the premise that women are less interested in sports, is to ignore the fact that Title IX was enacted in order to remedy the discrimination that results from stereotyped notions of women's interest and ability. Since interest and ability, quote, evolve as a function of opportunity and experience, universities have an affirmative duty, not just to create more teams, but to recruit students to fill them. Um, and to offer, if you offer scholarships to men, you have to offer the same number of scholarships to women. So Brown was expected to go out and recruit students to fill these slots to reach the parity standard. This was the first major appearance of the argument that the purpose of Title IX was to counteract stereotypes. Not just stereotypes of the students there or the faculty, but the, but the stereotypes of people who might apply to Brown um, or uh, the, the population as a whole. Um, and the motto of this form of regulation became the famous line from Field of Dreams, build it and they will come. You build the facilities, women uh, would become more interested, and they will become equally interested in sports as are men. Um, now this question of whether male and female interested in athletics is, has some basis in psychology or is entirely socially constructed. Um, was, was a very heated one in the courts um, and in the academic literature, um, the socially constructed version one. But there was a second 
point um, that didn't receive nearly as much attention. Um, and that is, what do we count as an athletic opportunity? And here I think it's really useful to think of what, civil rights law as a form of government regulation. Because the first, uh, what we did um, in counting athletic opportunities was to focus on a very narrow slice of athletics. Um, when you see these numbers on athletic opportunity, what they're really counting is varsity slots. Not club sports, not intramural sports, not fitness, just varsity. So why? Well, one reason, um, familiar to anyone who studies the regulation, is that was the easiest things for regulators to count. Um, if you're going to count all of these other things, you have to say, well, how do we weigh the difference between a yoga class and a football player? You know, a football player costs a lot more. But you know, they're both athletic participation. The, court, uh, the regulators said, too complicated. Let's focus on varsity level. Reinforcing this was the, the NCAA. The NCAA first tried to kill Title IX as it applied to sports. They tried this repeatedly, and they failed. They then took the position, if we can't beat them, let's take them over. Uh, there were, there were there was an organization of women athletics um, that I think had a much healthier understanding of the role of sports. Um, they basically drove them out of business, um, took them over because they had more money, um, and they put the emphasis upon highly um, competitive uh, uh, championships, um, and uh, many women's uh, sports kind of took that money. Um, they liked the visibility, uh, and they bought into the NCAA's understanding of the role of sports in, in, in uh, the educational world. The, the third reason that there was this big focus on varsity level, highly competitive sports is that one of the most important women's groups supporting um, this form of regulation was something called uh, the Women's Sports Federation, founded by Billie Jean King, and their role was to encourage the most professional level of sports, to use colleges really to become the farm teams for the Olympics uh, and for women's professional teams, just the way we have uh, used colleges as farm teams for the, for the NFL. Um, and finally, uh, the part that I, I, I found puzzled over a bit was why did the other women's groups, especially the National Women's Law uh, Foundation, uh, uh, Foundation, buy into this? And I think that the reason is because of the visibility of sports. Their attitude is we want to change women's understanding of sports, their role in it. We want to overcome stereotypes about women passivity and weakness. And because college sports is so visible, this was a good way to do it. Um, but the bottom line was that for all of these reasons, interest groups, regulatory ease, um, the, that uh, this became the unquestioned way in which we counted whether we were reaching equality in athletics. Now, this raises the question, what if you build it and nobody comes? Um, this came up in a number of uh, cases, one of which, I'll just cite uh, one case, in Indiana. As you probably know, Indiana loves basketball. Um, and there was a question of whether, when the girls' teams would uh, play their basketball teams. Um, this became a federal uh, court suit, and the Seventh Circuit in 2012 required school systems to uh, schedule more girls' basketball teams on Fridays and Saturdays. Relegating girls' games to non-prime time, the court held, I'm quoting here, uh, results in a loss of, a of, of audience fosters feelings of inferiority that oppresses girls' interest in basketball. Quote, Dis uh, disparate scheduling creates a cyclical effect that stifles community supports, prevents the development of a fan base, discourages females from participating in a traditionally male-dominated sport. Title IX requires schools to counteract these stereotype notions of women's interest and ability by increasing the audience for girls' sports. I just quote this as that, that now we're talking about changing stereotypes among the audience not just among students. So that became really the dominant theme. And I'll now turn quickly to two examples in which this played out in significantly more controversial ways. The first is the transgender issue. Um, now, uh, the sports uh, uh, issue played out over decades. And what I was really amazing, from a political science point of view, what's amazing about the transgender issue is how rapidly it rose to prominence. Um, 
For decades, almost everyone had agreed that the non-discrimination provisions of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and Title IX of the Education Amendments did, did not extend to sexual orientation or transgender status. Um, the, the Justice Department argued that, that it did not apply. And I think most importantly, until 2014, President Obama said, if we want to add discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and transgender status, we need to change the laws. Um, because the current laws don't cover that. Starting in 2014, the Obama administration switched its position. Basically, the, what, what changed was it became clear that Congress wasn't going to change the law, um, and the Obama administration was getting a lot of pressure um, to address the issue. So the, um, the White House issued orders to Department of Education, Department of Justice, Department of Labor, um, almost all parts of the government, that to include transgender status um, and sexual orientation to the regulations of discrim on discrimination. Again, we had leapfrogging. Um, the foundation of, uh, well, let me see, um, for Title IX, I should have mentioned, the, the big act was in 2016, a Dear Colleague letter saying that um, when, when you're uh, providing uh, opportunities that, um, that involve sex segregation, sports, um, bathrooms, locker rooms, uh, living facilities, um, you must respect the student's gender identity even if it, it, if it conflicts with their biological sex. So if they say, um, I am a female, I should use a female bathroom, I should play on a female team, I should be able to use female pronouns, I should have a female roommate, then you, uh, you have to respect that choice regardless of any biological uh, disparity between their identity um, uh, and their biology. So um, this was obviously very controversial. This was kind of part of the bathroom um, uh, wars in North Carolina. What was the basis for this? Well. Um, the, the lower courts a few years earlier had started to say that Title VII does not allow discrimination on the basis of transgender status in employment. And those courts had gone back to a 1990, uh, 1989 Title VII employment discrimination case called Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins. In that case, four members of the court um, agreed that failure to promote a woman woman for not acting in a sufficiently ladylike fashion constitutes sex discrimination. An employer violates Title VII if this four-member plurality said, um, if the employer's discrimination were likely influenced by sex stereotyping. As Justice Brennan put it, Congress intended to strike the, at the entire spectrum of disparate treatment of men and women resulting from sex stereotyping. Again, that, that key term. Now, this didn't involve a question of, of gender identity, but one could argue, I don't think it's too much of a stretch, to say that if you fire someone who is biologically male because they're wearing a dress and they want to be referred to as she, that's relying on sexual stereotypes. That's saying, if a, though a woman does this, she can stay. A man does it, he can't stay. So you can make an argument that, the, that employment discrimination um, does violate the, the norms of, of, of uh, sex non-discrimination. Um, but that's, the, the, the OCR the started there and then made a number of big leaps. The first leap came in 2010 in another Dear Colleague letter. Um, there are a lot of these Dear Colleague letters. And this was on bullying. Um, and that dear colleague letter said, it can be sex discrimination if students are harassed either for exhibiting what is perceived as sex uh, stereotypical characteristics for their sex or for failing to conform to stereotypical notions of masculinity and femininity. Okay, so, you know, we don't want people being bullied on the basis of transgender status. Um, whether that should be a federal regulation is one thing, but, you know, it's easy to say we don't want that type of bullying. But then when OCR went in to investigate these claims of bullying, then they took yet another step. And they said, um, we are, that you can't, when you allocate bathrooms and other sex segregated facilities, it has to be based on gender identity, not sex. That's much different. Um, 
And this was uh, based on investigations. We said we investigated these things, we came to this agreement, and that's the basis for the Dear Colleague letter. Pretty flimsy, actually. Um, the problem with this uh, understanding of Title IX was that the term gender identity is created, was created to distinguish one's internal feelings of gender from one's external biology. That's the purpose, that sex was biology and gender was identity. But now we were being told that the word sex can only mean gender identity. So you really had to torture the language of the statutes to get there. But the un understanding was that you really want to undo all understandings of sexual stereotypes. And uh, that gender, uh, transgender status was above all about gender stereotypes. Shortly after she left the Office for Civil Rights, Assistant Secretary Catherine Lehman um, said to an interviewer, quote, the bathroom question was never just about bathrooms. It is about who that child is in school and how that child will be perceived and seen. And I think that's really quite accurate of what they were. They wanted to change people's perceptions of what transgender status is. Um, and what, you know, that's kind of the most extreme version of challenging all types of sexual stereotypes. Um, now let me move on. How am I doing on time here? Yeah, plenty. Okay. Um, I want to make sure I leave plenty of time for, for questions. Um, sexual harassment. Um, this is in some ways probably going to be the biggest controversy over the next um, many years. Obviously with the Me Too movement, this has great um, importance and great um, uh, visibility. It took 25 years before the Office for Civil Rights addressed the sexual harassment issue at all. Um, it wasn't until the early 1990s. Uh, and then it was after a series of court decisions. This started, really started in the courts. Um, and it took another 20 years um, for any serious enforcement to take place. Now, the reason for this long delay, I think, is twofold. The first is that um, the issue here is not what schools themselves are doing. This is not the institutional barriers to education. Rather, the issue is what is happening to female students um, in the, um, often in private, um, with, uh, at the hands of fellow students or faculty members. So this was really private behavior by thousands of people in ways that are often hard to detect what is going on. Um, and the issue was what is the responsibility of a university or a primary and secondary school for policing this type of activity? So that's difficulty number one. Difficulty number two is that we can all agree that sexual harassment is a very serious problem and something that we want to discourage. But why is it discrimination? Um, that's not such an easy question to answer. Um, you could say, well, it's aimed at women most of the time, which is absolutely true. Um, but of course, the courts have said if it's aimed at men, it's equally um, serious and equally a violation of federal law. Um, uh, initially, in the 1970s, when this these issues came up, many courts said this is not part of sex discrimination law. This is a private matter. It might be a serious matter, but it's not discrimination. But then many courts started to say, well, it is discrimination because if I am a male harasser, I am harassing women. I'm a I am discriminating in my harassing behavior um, and targeting women. Similarly, if I were uh, a gay harasser, I would be targeting one sex, which is other men. Uh, same for women targeting men, or uh, so. But what about, what about the indiscriminate bisexual harasser? Um, this actually came up in a number of court decisions. And the court said, well, of course, a bisexual harasser is not discriminating in either good or the bad sense. Um, therefore, it's not illegal. It's kind of bizarre, right? So um, in uh, a, a DC Circuit opinion, um, a writ, a dissent written by Judge Bork uh, and joined by Judge, uh, Judge Scalia, um, uh, Judge Bork said, this is a bizarre result. Um, had Congress been aiming at sexual harassment, it seems unlikely that a woman would be protected from unwelcome heterosexual or lesbian advances, but left unprotected when a bisexual attacks. So, the, court respond, the courts responded to this problem of why is harassment discrimination by saying, never mind, <laughs> it is. 
and don't ask why. Part of, I gotta say, part of the reason for this is a famous decision by Justice Scalia. He said, let's not probe into uh, kind of the psychology of harassers. That's too much for the courts. Um, and he was probably right about that, but that really meant that we're just not gonna, we're not gonna, we're gonna sweep this under the rug. Now the important point here I want to make is the reason the, uh, that the rationale you provide for saying why harassment is discrimination has a big effect on what you want to do about it. This is same like Brown versus Board of Education. We can argue at length about what Brown should have done. We can come to different arguments for what, it, what, what the court should have said, but the different arguments lead to different remedies. Um, the, uh, and there was a big debate about which of two sets of remedies would be appropriate. The first approach, this was first developed under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and Employment Discrimination, largely developed by the courts. Um, and they said basically that um, employers have a responsibility for making sure that harassing behavior by employers is rooted out. What they have to do, number one, is have a policy saying that this is illegal. Number two, they have to have an effective way of complaining about it. Uh, and number three, they have to take prompt action to get rid of the harassers. <coughs> if they did not do this, and this was the, rem this was the, the, the uh, way in which the courts would impose penalties, they were, they were liable for significant monetary damages. So the understanding underlying this liability regime was twofold. One is most of this harassing behavior is done by a few bad apples, almost entirely men. Um, but there are a few bad apples. You have to root them out. And number two, that the best way to do this is to provide really strong monetary incentives for employers. That if they don't do this, they're gonna have to pay big bucks. Standard liability model. Um, originally, when OCR started to look at this in mid-1990s, they took that model. They adapted that model from employment and applied it to education. But, and here is a little kind of change in the leapfrogging uh, uh, model. But the next year, and the year after that, in 1998 and 1999, the Supreme Court said, no, that what, what Office for Civil Rights has done is really expands Title IX beyond what was intended. So they took a very lenient standard of liability um, for educational institutions. Um, the Supreme Court said that in order to be liable for damages under Title IX, the school had to have actual knowledge of the misconduct by the teacher or student and act with deliberate indifference. Now I think you can criticize that to say that really encourages schools to put their head in the sand. Um, and many uh, law review articles uh, argued that. Um, and there was really an outpouring of criticism of the Supreme Court. Now you, what you would expect to happen was the OCR would say, well, we have to follow the court um, and maybe push for more le different legislation. That was hard since the Republicans controlled the Congress at the time. But instead of saying, okay, we'll just defer to what the court said, on the last day of the Clinton administration, literally the last day, um, they, OCR published a new regulation um, that said, we're not gonna follow the court. As a matter of fact, we're going to increase our standards to make it increase what we demand of, uh, of schools, and we are going to make sure they put into a program uh, the schools take to prevent, eliminate, and remedy sexual harassment. I just want to repeat those words. Prevent, eliminate, and remedy sexual harassment. If you have a school with tens of thousands of students, if you can prevent and eliminate it, um, that's quite a big task. Now, um, this created a real dilemma for the Office for Civil Rights. You can't, how do you enforce this? You can't rely on the funding cutoff, and now you can't go to court because you've gone so far from what the courts do, uh, have said. So for, during all of the Bush administration, those regulations lay dormant. Um, and it wasn't until two years into the Obama administration um, that they resuscitated those, that approach and really built uh, substantially upon it. Um, and what, uh, I, I don't want to go into too much detail on what they did. Some of you might know, uh, experience in, uh, 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 here at Princeton. But the, the two foundational elements of the liability regime were replaced 
with a new understanding of what sexual harassment was and what should be done about it. Um, the, uh, i just back up for a minute here and say that among the critics of the liability regime established in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, were feminist legal professor, uh, scholars, most notably Catherine McKinnon. Um, and McKinnon had two criticisms of that legal liability regime. The first is um, that um, sexual harassment is not the result of a few bad apples. It's the result of the culture. Um, it is structural. Um, to uh, quote McKinnon, a tort law, she said, considers individual and compensable something that is fundamentally social and should be eliminated. Sexual harassment must be viewed as part of a larger pattern of subordination of women. Quote, women historically have been required to exchange sexual services for material survival in one form or another. Prostitution and marriage, as well as sexual harassment, are different ways, in different ways, institutionalize this arrangement. So it is structural, it is inherent. Um, and secondly, um, Institutions are so complicit in, in this culture um, that you can't rely on a few monetary damage, the threat of, of monetary losses, to do anything about it. You have to fundamentally change the institution. And both of those assumptions were built into the, the uh, rules that the Obama administration issued in 2011 and 2014. Um, they were very explicit about this. The point, they repeatedly said, is to change the culture. I think that if you, learn, you know, hear what universities are saying, that change the culture is ubiquitous language. Um, we have to change the way we think, people think about the relations between uh, the sexes. We have to tra train and retrain everyone. So that's the first big change of changing the culture. The second was that we, especially since OCR could not rely on monetary damages, they had to do something else, they wanted to, to create very strong, autonomous, um, compliance organizations within universities. So how did they go about doing this? They said, uh, OCR said, if, you, if there is a complaint against you, just one individual complaint, your institution, and I assume this happened to Princeton, it's happened to almost all major schools, um, we will have an investigation that will be long, it will be damaging to your reputation, it will require lots of data, and we're not going to stop investigating until you agree to a very extensive compliance agreement. And that compliance agreement requires building a very large Title IX office that has uh, powers to investigate, that has powers to impose penalties, and that has power to train virtually everyone in the university. Um, and I think there was a very clever way of, kind of building these compliance organizations, making them closely related to the Office for Civil Rights and other professional associations, um, and that those organizations will stay in place long after the regulations of the Dear Colleague letters themselves disappear. So what do these compliance organizations do? Um, well, as I said, and you probably have been the subject of this, they involve a lot of training. Um, tra um, training that teaches the people between um, healthy, mutually respectful sexual relationships and um, improper sexual relationships. Uh, uh, Yale, uh, for example, tells students, hold out for enthusiasm. In general, it's easy to tell if someone is enthusiastic about a counter or not. I'm not sure that's true, but um, it may, seems to be true at Yale. Um, the University of Georgia advises to, this is one of my favorites, if you are not accustomed to communicating with your partner about sex and sexual activity, the first few times might feel awkward, but practice makes perfect. Be creative and spontaneous. Don't give up. They seem not to have realized that the Office of Civil Rights said if, you re if there are repeated overtures that are rejected, that is sexual harassment. Um, so if you don't, you better give up before too long. Um, in a really important uh, law review, California Law Review article, Harvard Law Professor Jake Burson and Jeannie Souk noted that the college, the, what they call the college sex bureaucrats who run these federally mandated programs, quote, are not simply training students on the rules of rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment. Rather, quote, they are instructing on, advising on, counseling on, defining, monitoring, investigating, adjudicating questions of sexual desire. Sexual violence education and prevention program is rapidly morphing into sexual instruction reminiscent of guidance provided by sex therapists like Dr. Ruth. 
So uh, the, the, the point I'd like to stress here is that this really too has to do with sexual stereotypes, how we think about sexual relations, how we think about sexual activity, how we think about gender relations. Um, I was trying to decide whether to include this part, but um, I, will, I will include a reference to an ad for a person in the Title IX office in Princeton. I'm not sure if, you, if you're aware of this, but in 2017, Princeton uh, offered a new position for interpersonal violence clinician and men's engagement manager. The person will, will develop, quote, challenging, uh, will, will uh, promote programs that challenge gender stereotypes in those belief systems and social constructs that contribute to violence. Candidates for the position must possess knowledge about the challenges and privileges of male identity formation and expertise in social justice issue. Um, I think this is quite typical of many of these ads. I, I will say to the, uh, we have a lot of political theory graduate students in Boston College, and I say, boy, th this is a new job opportunity because who knows about, more about social justice issues than political theory students? Um, but I don't think they're really looking for you. Um, now, um, these regulations of the Obama administration were withdrawn quickly by the Trump administration, but so far we've seen no evidence that there's much change in what universities are doing. Um, because the, we have, as political scientists, we know when you create an institution, uh, it's really hard uh, to change it. Um, now, so let me just close by a couple of uh, uh, generalizations. First is, um, you know, part of the problem here is we have a lot of very consequential decisions being made by a small number of judges and administrators with very little deliberation over cost um, or opportunities or alternatives. Um, and sometimes it's involved torturing legislative language. Um, I think we could all agree that this would be better done by Congress, but of course none of us are holding our breath that Congress is actually going to act on these things. Um, the second point I say, if we had a bit more deliberation, as I think we're starting to have on the sexual harassment regulations, we could avoid some of the greater, some of the biggest dangers that have occurred. Um, this is clearest with harassment, where the free speech and due process issues should have been aired before these regulations went into effect, rather than trying to work them out over years of controversy in their applications. Um, the third point is that, um, even programs where I think the overall effect had been beneficial, as in sports, it would have been extremely useful to think about the details of regulation and how they were actually affecting women's education. Uh, I noticed when I was coming in here that this is the Bowen Building, so I will make a reference to William Bowen, the former president of Princeton, who wrote a, uh, with his co-authors two really excellent volumes on college sports. And what Bowen and his co-authors found was that when you looked at women's sports in the 1970s, um, you found that women athletes had about the same high school records as non-athletes. They got about the same grades. They went to grad school more often um, because they seemed to be more ambitious, um, more adventuresome, more energetic. That, that's what their uh, pr presumption was. After Title IX took effect, by the 1990s, they went back and said, what, what do we know about women athletes? Their high school records were significantly inferior to the high school records of other women. Um, they didn't even do as well in their, uh, their grades in college as their previous record would have indicated. They went to grad school less. Um, and by the way, they were also whiter than the average undergraduate. Um, uh, that, that recruited athletes tend to be, uh, have fewer minorities than does the, st the student body as a, as a whole. Um, and the, uh, Bowen and his co-authors put it this way, the woman athlete appears to have been caught up, appear to have caught up with their male counterpart, a dubious distinction. Another uh, author on this topic says that men were, the women were drawn into the mess that men had been before. So the question I wish got raised more often in these contexts. Um, and I think would be erased more often if we had a more deliberative process. Are these things good for the education of women? That was the purpose of this legislation. Um, and I think we've lost track of that fundamental question, and I hope at some point we get back to basics. Thank you, Chef. Uh, who knew that regulation was so interesting? Right, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So we're going to open it up for questions now. Uh, are there any students uh, who would like to ask the first question? All right, you can come in later if you like. Uh, so I'll, we'll open it up to anyone. Yeah, Lee. So I, I learned a lot about Title IX, which I hadn't known before, and I appreciated that. And so it was actually interesting learning about all the different regulations and, and letters. Uh, so one of your claims is that the that this is a controversial area in part because of the underlying substance, so the, 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 the status of transgender people, mm -hmm. bathrooms, etc. But but I, I would like to get your thoughts on: Is it also a, the case, though, that part of the reason for the controversy is that this is these are one size fits all rules for an entire very diverse nation? And even think about the particular point about harassment. Most people think harassment's bad. Most people think due process is good, but lots of reasonable people would reasonably disagree about how you put those two things together. And so isn't this also a story about the problem of one size fits all federal bureaucracy? Um, thanks for the question. You're absolutely right, and that's a crucial part of this. Um, and I, I mean, one of the, uh, I frequently get asked the question, well, what would you do? You know, how would you uh, design uh, sexual ha harassment rules so that we, we do something about the most serious parts of the problem? And part of my response is that I don't, uh, I don't think that we should say that there is going to be one rule for every institution. So for example, um, if Brigham Young says, uh, on our campus there will be no sexual relationships outside of marriage, and enforce it. Actually, my college, Boston College, says that, but they never enforce it. Um, I assume that maybe there are many other coll Catholic colleges that say it, but don't enforce it. If you want to enforce that, I think that's fine. And as students go there, know that. Um, so how you can have stronger rules, um, take advantage of the fact that um, the, the colleges are a highly competitive institute, uh, a market. Um, now for public schools, that's, a, that's, a little, uh, that's obviously less true, um, they're in a large part a monopoly. Um, so there could be different, there could be different, uh, part of the problem is we're saying we're going to have the same set of rules for colleges, every college, and the same set of rules are going to apply then to high schools and elementary schools and kindergartens. So the, what it constitutes harassment on a kindergarten playground is going to be different than what uh, in a college dorm. Um, and to, I'll just add to your point about trying to apply these rules the same everywhere. We have, we have the process of leapfrogging meant that we took the rules developed in employment and then applied them in educational institutions. And what many undergraduates under, learn after they learn leave college is the employment situation tends to be a bit more structured. We don't allow a lot of drinking on, on the job in, uh, in employment. Um, we don't have dorms unless you work for Google. Uh, so, you know, there are different contexts. And let me actually give you, to, this is really just to emphasize your point. Let me, the, um, the current proposal that's being, uh, it was floated at HHS on um, the definition of sex. Um, I think uh, there's the danger that uh, Republican administrations will fall into this one-size-fits-all approach, too. So they tried to say, sex means biology at birth. Um, I think that's a bad idea. Number one, because biology at birth might be wrong. There are a lot of kind of intersex, not a lot. There's a very tiny number of people who are intersex, and they might, that might have been wrong. People can have sex change operations. Um, you know, so the, the good example of why having one rigid rule doesn't work very well for a very complicated situation. And if some schools want to do things differently, um, if they choose that that's the, the, the model they want to follow, I don't see what's wrong with that. So I really oppose this type of rigid definition of the law, whether it's done by on the liberal or the conservative end. Any questions? Yes, in the back. What would be the next steps to take to remedy the problems we see in Title IX regulations? Right, that's a good question. So the, the, the best thing to do, as I meant, in, indicated won't happen, is to actually have Congress speak more directly on what it wants, what it expects. But I think that the, probably the most important thing to do is to change the process. Um, so there's number one, more open and participatory, there's more consideration of costs, including opportunity costs. Um, you, uh, you figure out what the problems are going to be from the, from the beginning. 
Um, and I, I guess I, I, I generally have very few positive things to say about the Trump administration. Um, but, here I, uh, but here I think they've done something right, which is they really have committed themselves to the notice and comment rulemaking process in the Department of Education. But you should get to recognize that it's a very, very slow process. Um, when Secretary DeVos said that she was going to, uh, she said the, the, the era of rule by letter is over. So no more dear colleague letters. Um, and she was going to do through notice and comment rulemaking. Uh, reporters called me and said, well, so they'll do this. They know what they want to do. They'll do it in a month or two, right? And I said, no way. You know, I said, it's going to take well over a year. You know, I was actually optimistic because it's well over a year and we don't even have a proposal. Um, so this is a really long process, but uh, I think it's beneficial. Um, there has been more participation in this rulemaking than ever before um, under Title IX. Um, there's going to be a lot of controversy, but that's, that's politics. Um, you see several times in your talk that the original intent of Title IX was to remove institutional barriers mm -hmm. to women's education. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the sources from which you're getting that. Is that, are you talking about the legislative history yeah. or so the historical that's surrounding that moment or the cases that were brought immediately? <coughs> or, I yeah, just wondered if you could yeah that, that's a very, that's a, I'll try my best to answer that question. That's a good question. Um, first of all, uh, I would say yes on the legislative history. Um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the examples that were used, the emphasis was always on women can't join this, can't be in this degree program. There, were, there are public institutions that women can't apply to at all. Um, and actually, I think that if you look back at the sponsors of the program, especially um, uh, Congressman Green, um, and she had uh, people doing research for her, they were primarily disturbed at the really rank discrimination against uh, women professors. Because um, at that time, Title VII did not apply to educational institutions, and it did not apply to state and local institutions. That came later. Um, uh, I would just say, when I was in, when I was in college at Harvard, um, there was the only female faculty member when I started in 1969 was Judith Schlar, who was really a renowned political theorist. And she was a lecturer. Um, so you, you didn't have to look very far to see the extent of discrimination. Um, now, um, part of the problem of answering a question is that the legislative history is not all that extensive. We have statements by Senator Bayh and, and Congressman Green, but um, it, it was a floor amendment in the Senate. And it was slipped in in the House, and Congressman Green said to her allies, don't talk about this. Uh, there's no opposition. It'll slip through. Don't make a big deal of it. So they didn't. Um, and when uh, President Nixon signed the Education Amendments of 1972, he didn't mention Title IX. It didn't seem that important. Um, and the New York Times reported on it the next day, no mention of Title IX. Um, so this was really under the radar screen. Part of the reason for that, by the way, was Congress just before that had passed the Equal Rights Amendment and sent it to the states. So basically they were saying, you know, this is just, you know, we'll do piecemeal what we want to do wholesale with the Equal Rights Amendment. When the Equal Rights Amendment didn't get the requisite number of states behind it, then Title IX became far more important. Um, but I, so the, I would give that evidence of what was behind the, pe the concerns of the people who were most forceful. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that um, we did have this one notice and comment rulemaking period in 1975, uh, which was very elaborate in the, during the 40s administration, lots of participation, and the focus was almost entirely on these institutional aspects. Um, there was no discussion whatsoever of sexual harassment or, um, or changing stereotypes. Because there was a lot of work to do. Yeah, and occasionally read about these cases of, of students challenging the decisions of the autonomous enforcement right. bodies. Yeah. Is there a general trend or trends among those cases, and are they affecting yeah. the way that it's enforced? Yeah, that's another that's an important issue, so thanks for asking. That, that there have been a very large number of suits brought by people who have been um, disciplined for sexual harassment, and then they've gone to court and said, we've been denied due process. Um, what is surprising about those cases is how many times um, the plaintiffs in those cases have, have won or that uh, the school has signed uh, an agreement and paid over money. 
Um, so usually when schools go to court um, with uh, uh, challenges by students, they lose. But they've lost, uh, schools have lost a lot of these, and they're losing some big bucks in some cases. So if you ask, what is the counter pressure to the creation of these in Title IX offices, I think that is the primary counter pressure. Um, and I, I expect that there's going to be increasing conflict between Title IX offices and the general counsel in universities who have to defend these suits. Um, so uh, I think in that, that I think is going to grow. I don't, what's going to happen, I believe, um, is that I assume that the regulations proposed by the Trump administration is going to require more due process protections. That's pretty clear. Um, therefore, um, schools that don't comply with that will have a little more difficulty defending themselves in court. And I think there's going to be pressure to, to modify the due process requirements to give um, cross some form of cross-examination rights to people who are accused, to do away with what I think is the most egregious um, form of investigation, which is the so-called single investigator model, which OCR really pushed this sub rosa. And it says that there will, the Title IX office will appoint one investigator who will do the investigation and determine guilt um, and then recommend a penalty. And that can't be reviewed. You know, if you try to think of so where, what is something that denies anyone the basics of due process, that's it. Um, and I think schools are going to be very wary of doing that because they're going to lose suits. So that, I think that's an important feature. This is the very back. Please. Hi, yes, thank you so much. Um, whenever there's a regulation passed, someone loses, okay? Yeah. So when um, the girls are, have more access to college, some of the boys don't get in, right? When you have equal or parity uh, on, uh, in sports on college campuses, Yes, the girls have a gymnastics team, yeah. but the boys don't because there's a football team, right? Right, right. exactly. Um, and then in now with the uh, gender yeah. identity, yeah. you have, um, okay, transgender people can walk into someone else's bathroom, mm -hmm. but then those girls have to deal with the perps who come in there. Right. There's always a law. Can you address that sometimes? Sure, yeah, I mean, that, that really goes to the heart of the problem, right? Because you have to consider, um, Whatever you're making any policy, you have to consider the cost, including the opportunity costs. So who does it? You, if you spend more money on athletics, what do you spend less money on? Um, if you're going to give uh, bonuses to athletes, who doesn't get in um, to raise an issue that's quite current now? If you have affirmative action programs that helps blacks and Hispanics, um, who is losing out? And of course, we're increasing now it's Asian students. Um, so that is the crucial, uh, that is really a crucial issue. And so, for example, the transgender issue, um, what the, the Dear Colleague letter said that I think is quite remarkable is that, that you have to follow this requirement no matter who complains about loss of privacy. It was quite remarkable. You know, other complaints don't have any weight whatsoever. Um, and to talk about the way in which these programs start, regulations start to conflict, um, I'm kind of struck by the fact um, that if a person with male genitalia works into a female locker room, that's okay unless they tell a dirty joke. And then they can be guilty of sexual harassment uh, because a dirty joke can be considered part of sexual harassment. So it's kind of an odd thing where we, we reward some kind of sensitivities but not others. Um, the, um, and most, it's the problem that you point to is clearest with um, due process, um, because we have to consider the rights of both sets of people. And part of, you know, uh, of putting together good programs is trying to balance those rights in a thoughtful way. And the form that regulation has taken um, tends to um, obviate the need to do that kind of balancing consideration of opportunity costs. Yes, thank you. Um, I know that like, you were talking about how the original intent of Title IX was to remove barriers to female education, and how that later like, became, you know, like, it started going to sexuality and gender identity, things like that. But would it, could it be that um, that transformation was a result of the success of the laws originally intended? Yeah. So they thought, you know, it succeeded as intended, so now let's repackage it in a different mm -hmm. way. and use the same language to push other stuff into it. Right. Um, I, I think that's a, uh, exactly what happened, was once you start doing the most obvious things, then you start thinking, what are some of the other things that we can do? 
Um, and I mean, I, I'll say that there is, here's, here's the, the logic here, which, is, which is, has some, uh, some appeal, which is that if you really want to get the heart of educational inequality, you have to get at the underlying views of people in society. That's what's really holding women back. Um, and uh, in some areas, I think that you know, there's some basis for that. But what I, what, and this really goes back to kind of countervailing concerns. Um, the thing what I mo worry most about in this area is that we have lost the sense of what limited government is. Um, and the limited government is above all that we don't engage in massive re-education plans, especially at the federal level. Um, and I think that's, in, in, in a subtle way, that's what we've been trying to do in, um, in, uh, uh, with Title IX. Let me just, uh, to take your question, uh, the other, one thing I haven't said anything about, but I think it's really crucial here, was the way in which we've taken concepts from, from race and applied them to sex. So obviously, we don't allow separate but equal in athletics. No one would think we should have a, a football, a, a black and a white football team. Actually, I want to get back to your point about football. But, um, but we do, so we think that there are races in some ways like sex, in other ways quite different. Um, so uh, why do we start saying that sex sexual harassment is discrimination? Because I think you can, uh, you can clearly argue that racial harassment is discriminatory. If you, if you are a minority in a job and someone, you're subject to, to, to racial epithets on the job and your employer doesn't do anything about it, who could deny that that is racial discrimination? They're trying to get rid of you. Um, and that should be illegal. Um, similarly, if there are, women have to face um, constant taunts that you shouldn't be here or uh, you know, you know, vile epithets. You know, that is trying to drive women out of those jobs, and that should be Ill illegal. But there is usually a difference between racial and sexual harassment, which is most forms of sexual harassment are named at a particular individual, rather than saying, I don't like black people or, or Hispanics or Asian people as a whole. I'm actually going to target on Evie. <laughs> um, and that's a different type of problem. Um, and has led to a lot of the difficulties in regulation. So we try to use this race-sex analogy in so many areas, and often we don't think about the, the big differences. And I just wanted to, I, I meant to say something about football. Football, um, as uh, Sports Illustrated said, is the, is the fat man rocking the Title IX canoe. Um, because in order to, um, to have a football team, you might have 100 players because you've got to have an offense and defense and special team and everyone gets hurt, so you have to have replacements and they're really costly to have all this stuff. And the University of Michigan has not just a Harbaugh who, uh, coach who earns uh, uh, gazillions of dollars, but three assistant coaches who each make a million dollars. That's a lot of money. Um, and in order, so uh, we have to come up with either women's teams that have lots of members um, that's why crew is big, because you can have several eights and fours and twos and JV and everything. Um, or you have to eliminate some of the guys' teams. And uh, various times we've done all of those things. I'll just tell one quick story. This is a good story about uh, those of us who study regulation know there are always a lot of unintended consequences. People try to get around the rules. Um, one of the ways of getting, uh, trying to add more women um, uh, varsity team members at low cost is crew. Um, so Arizona State, which exists in a desert, <laughs> decided that they were going to spend, put a lot of effort into crew. So they made their own little river, um, and they recruited students despite the fact there is, not a, there is not a crew at the high school level in Arizona because all of Arizona is a desert. Um, so you get, you, we, we think we have reform, we get consequences. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, whether the broadening of regulations is good or bad, uh, do you think there's any truth in the argument that these regulations multiply because of the breakdown of the family structure in America? That essentially, what I'm saying is my generation of family parents have not done a good job yeah. teaching their children basic good and not so good. People shouldn't have to be told how to treat people in college. To me, that's just basic decency. If your parents raise you correctly, you treat people, individuals, with a certain amount of respect. You shouldn't have to depend on a college. To, to me, they're yeah. insulting. If I was an employee, 
if I was a student, any institution who has to teach me basic right and wrong, that would be an affront to me, that my parents didn't do a good job. And I, I don't know if anybody else would feel <coughs> that way, but, but to me, it's just insulting. I actually have a, one way in which I would agree with you and one way disagree with you. Um, I must admit that with the Me Too movement, I'm continually appalled at the bad behavior of men. Um, and I've got a feeling this is not really recent. Um, I think that there have been some bad actors for a long time. But, and here's where I will agree with you, um, to look at this way, that I, I'd say, kind of, here's a generalization. Um, as social norms break down, we increasingly look for more formal rules to fill that gap. And I think that's what's happened in college campuses. As um, we've kind of ended parietals, the students here have no idea what a parietal is. Um, that we, we have co-ed dorms, we have, um, we, we have eroded a normal, uh, a previous existing understandings of courtship and dating. I've been told that people don't even date anymore. Curfews. Have curfews. So all of these formal rules um, have, been, have eroded, and I think that college students um, are often very confused about what, prop, what, what the right norms are. Um, and I, I, that, that, that leads to a lot of misunderstandings. Um, with the Kavanaugh hearings, there was a lot of debate about whether we should believe all survivors. Now, I will say that I believe all survivors because, because if, they are, if they are a survivor, they really have, have uh, experienced something serious. Um, the question is whether we believe all accusers. Um, and uh, in, in looking at the cases at, at the college level, what, what strikes me more than anything else, I think is extremely unusual for any accuser to lie. I just don't think that people very often do that. There might be an isolated case here or there, but people have much different perceptions of what happened in these circumstances. Um, so the question is, whose perception of what happened in this um, very difficult, intimate circumstance is more accurate? And boy, that's a hard thing to tell. And I don't think we should talk about, you know, accuse people of lying, but we should recognize that different perceptions because of this norm confusion um, that really is at the heart of a lot of these issues. Other questions? Um, I can go yes. first. Yes. So, you want to go first. OK. <laughs> I'm curious, you started off the talk we talking a bit about the traditional conception of education. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a, a latent theme throughout. And when you spoke about uh, different ways that universities might arrange themselves, you said, Maybe just related to the last topic that you spoke about especially, how do you understand the, the basic principles of education here that are at stake and how they're being applied that might require yeah. more rules for, say, preventing, or say, having uh, sex segregated dorms, for mm -hmm. example, uh, as used to be the case, more rules about curfew and, and things like that. What, yeah. what are the principles of education yeah. at stake in those kinds of debates that you would handle, say, at a faculty level? In some ways, that is the most fundamental issue. Um, and part of my view about this is, about athletics, is that that is not a central part of, of education. I made that pretty clear. Now, um, clearly, you know, as a faculty member, I think that teaching and, uh, and research is the central mission of the institution. I have a little, let me just tell you, a, a controversy I think is probably going on at many schools. Um, it clearly is going on at my school, Boston College, where they, uh, there's a lot of emphasis placed on what is called student formation, which means, we used to call it character building, <laughs> but now we have to have euphemisms for it. Um, now, on the one hand, um, what I'd say is, I think that's certainly a, an important part of what we tried to teach in college. Um, but we shouldn't exaggerate the extent to which we, we are going to have a big effect on the central um, virtues and vices of 18 to 22 year olds. Um, I think we're exaggerating the extent to which we're actually, uh, most of this stuff's done in the family. Um, and a lot of this stuff is, is formed when they get there. But of course, I do think that there are certain really important things that we need to model. Um, for Keith Whittington was at BC giving a talk um, a couple weeks ago, and as he emphasized, one of the really crucial things is how do you have a civil debate? Um, you know, free speech is great, 
Um, I think we have uh, curtailed it far too much on many campuses. But we, ought, we have to be models of civil debate and not just provocation. Um, now, it's harder, much, much harder, I think, on these things about uh, uh, gender norms. Um, because that is very far from what happens in the classroom. We can, I, have, you know, I have debates in class about sexual harassment and transgender, but you know, I don't think the students, that has any effect on student character. Um, but here is one thing that I really do worry about, which is that I think many universities, including mine, but across the country, are putting much more emphasis on student affairs offices that are going to treat peop teach people um, what civility and social justice and sexual norms are. Um, some of you might have seen the, the uh, op-ed in the Times by Sam Abrams recently. Uh, you should, if not, you should see it. He basically said he did a survey of, um, of student affairs offices. Um, and he found that, um, that um, if you, when you do liberal conservative polls of student affairs officials, they make faculty members look conservative. Um, that is the kind of ratio of liberals to conservatives like 12 to 1 as opposed to 10 to 1 of faculty members. Um, I do worry we're creating a profession of people who think that they're going to mold the character of, of students in a way that has nothing to do with what I think are the central goals of university, which are serious education and research. Yes, sir. Uh, to piggyback off this gentleman's question, and I think you may have mentioned it to, to be a, a cultural issue mm -hmm. when you really dig down. Uh, we're sitting in an academic situation. Uh, it's not fair to say that what we discuss here works for false society. Mm -hmm. You have the family, you have school. You know, we're asking our teachers now to be uh, policemen. Uh, we're asking our teachers to be psychologists. That's not what they were trained to do. Okay, so you have a, you have a, have a great bottom up that's very difficult to create and probably is doing more damage to the educational system than we're sitting here talking about. I have nothing against people not going to college, but we're not addressing the situation of, okay, if somebody doesn't go to college, they're not going to be uh, held to certain standards or maybe even understand the standards unless culturally the, the whole society changes. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it's again what a lot of people say, you can be one side or the other, but sooner or later we have to get culturally more aware of each other. Mm -hmm. not, in, not in total agreement, but aware. And these problems, uh, the family units have changed. Uh, it's not just the husband and wife anymore. There's so many different interactions in the family, there's adoptions, there's interracial, there's biracial, etc. So I think we have a major problem that's, you know, just because you graduated from Princeton and you adhered to all these rules, that you're even going to use them when you uh, create your own family unit if you do, or you're going to be more concerned about uh, where, where Mr. Next buck is coming from. And I don't mean that uh, uh, derogatorily. Well, actually, I think what both of these questions pointed to, and I think this is one of the uh, larger themes in talking about Title IX, is that uh, the extent to which increasingly we're expecting colleges and universities and probably primary and secondary schools to go a lot of things that we didn't expect them to do before. Um, and uh, that uh, it, it's not clear that they do them, we can do all of these things well. Uh, so I do think this is, this is tied to a broader debate about the, the purposes of universities, which means a broader debate about the roles of universities within a democratic society. To what extent do we, do we think that the role of the university is to um, undo forms of inequalities that have been created by years of discrimination and by poor primary and secondary schools? Do we think that the, the, the kind of decline of clear rules about sexual behavior um, so all of these things have fallen upon the university, um, and they've often been uh, guided by these very uh, um, one-size-fits-all regulation. Um, and we're not going to address these issues very clearly in that form. But I've got to say, we're not going to solve these issues with a type of, of, 
babble that comes from most university presidents either. Um, and um, I, I think it probably is going to have to fall to the faculty um, to try to get universities to address these issues in a more serious way. But that's quite a challenge, and that's a long way from dear colleague letters. Chef, uh, let me ask a maybe uh, a stupid question. This one has to do with the fact that when, when Title IX was passed, the concern was the imbalance in the universities between men and women, mm -hmm. with um, men being the vast majority. Now we have a reversing situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Title IX, even though its purpose was to enhance the educational opportunities for women, it's written in a yeah. sex-neutral fashion, so it could now be looked at in light of, well, how do we advance, uh, how do we uh, benefit mm -hmm. men in the current situation now that the roles have been flipped? Uh, and, I mean, God knows, I don't want the Department of Education is doing any more regulations on these matters, but I wonder if that could happen. Yeah. You think of there is special programming, even at Princeton, especially at Princeton, maybe there is special programming for women mm -hmm. that you could look at and say, well, gee, where's the male counterpart to that? There isn't, right? Is that a problem yeah. under Title IX? Yeah. Well, that, that's um, very far from a stupid question. That's actually a question um, I've actually gotten a lot of uh, reporters calling me about and trying to um, not that I know a lot about it, but they've been asking about it. Um, because there are a number of suits um, and a number of complaints that come from o before OCR that um, there, are female, there, there are scholarship for females, there are programs for females, there are associations for females, there are no counterpart for males. Um, and to what extent are these compatible with Title IX? I think, um, and I, I think that is going to be a growing issue. Actually asked if, you know, I've sometimes asked, what's the next big issue in Title IX? I think that's one of them, and the other is going to be dress codes, um, of whether you can have different dress codes for males and females in, in elementary and secondary school. But uh, this is an, a really interesting issue. And uh, the, what I would say is that there are two considerations you want might take into account. One is, to what extent were some of these gender-specific programs based on, should I say, stereotypes that are no longer true? So if you basically say we have to encourage women to um, be more interested in biology. Well, they're, women get more PhDs in, than men in biology. So you know, that would be harder to justify. If you wanted to have a program to say you wanted to have more women in STEM programs, my view is why not? You know, what's, um, but at the same token, I would say my, my wife's a psychologist and she used to run a PhD internship program for uh, people getting their degree in psychology. And of about 25 interns, she didn't have a single male. Um, this is not good because um, there's, there's a real need for male social workers and psychologists. Um, so if we balance that by saying, let's have a program to encourage more men to go into these fields, I think that would be appropriate. Um, the other thing, um, I would say, you know, actually, um, I, I poked a little bit of fun at, um, at Princeton, but I also now will go on the attack about my alma mater, Harvard. Harvard um, basically said, if you are in a single-sex organization, by which they meant these final clubs, um, you can't have uh, a you can't be captain of your team. You can't apply for any special fellowship, and of course. Um, what every Harvard student wants is to apply for a fe special fellowship. So this is a real threat. Um, so in other words, if you get no money from the university, if you get no recognition from the university, you as a single sex organization um, are going to be at a severe disadvantage because your members are going to be told that they, they're going to pay a big price for this. I'm not sure why universities have to go so deeply into the private lives of their students. Um, so if you have clubs for various purposes to encourage uh, men or women, I think the university basically should stay out. Um, and I just one of my pet peeves at, at, at um, BC is that we have we spent a lot of money on something called the, the Office of Student Engagement. And we have like 10 administrators. Well, if you want to have students engage, give them the money and let them do it. Don't think that they need adult supervision to do these things. Um, and I, so I say the same thing about private clubs. Yeah, right, great. 
Well, please join me in thanking Chef Nolan.